the man known to history as Eric Hans Albert Reda, was born on the 24th of April 1876 in Wandsbeck, near to the city of Hamburg in Schleswig-Holstein, a former Danish province that had been seized by the German state of Prussia during the Second Schleswig War in 1867. His father was Hans Reda, a local schoolteacher, whilst his mother, Gertrude, came from a family of distinguished musicians who encouraged Eric's musical talents throughout his early years. Reda was a gifted student and was given stern encouragement from his parents. His father was a devoutly religious man who instilled in his children principles of discipline, frugality, and obedience. Eric was the eldest of three children, and his upbringing had a deep effect upon his leadership style as a naval officer, as would his father's distaste for party politics and his insistence that it was to be kept out of his home. This idea of him being above party politics became ingrained into Eric's worldview from a young age and would have a lasting impact on his life. Germany had, at the time of Eric's birth, been a collection of small and independent states that shared a common language and cultural traditions, but lacked any unity. In the 1860s, during a period in European history defined by a groundswell of intense nationalism, the large northern German state of Prussia, led by its indomitable chancellor Otto von Bismarck, embarked on a quest to unify and consolidate the German states into a single empire. Bismarck helped to lead his country into three wars in the 1860s, which would establish Prussian supremacy in Central Europe, whilst binding the German states to the Prussian emperor. The Dano-Prussian War of 1864 led Prussia to annex the region of Schleswig-Holstein in the north, whilst the Prusso-Austrian War of 1866 established Prussia as the dominant power in Germany and effectively excluded Austria from the German nation through the consolidation of German states in a confederation. Finally, the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 resulted in a dominant victory for Prussia and rallied the southern German states to unite with the north and form the German nation in 1871, the new unified state being proclaimed in the Palace of Versailles. Eric was thus born into a young, dynamic, energetic, and yet fragile nation that was eager to assert itself on the European stage and to develop its economic and political potential. Eric grew up in this world of competing empires and a rising Germany. Many Germans were thrilled by the consolidation, believing this would now allow for the German people to finally participate more fully on the world stage, particularly in developing colonies in places like the Pacific, Africa, and China. As Germany consolidated, the German Navy grew in importance and size as the crucial arm of the young nation's imperial dreams. The Navy became an essential part of any colonization scheme and soon became a source of pride for many nationalists who believed it symbolized the hope and destiny of the German state. Unlike the army, which was still influenced by the individual German states, the Navy was a purely national project, leading many in the German middle class to see it as one of the most noble causes in the nation. In 1894, Reda made the decision to become an officer in the Navy, despite the fact that he had, up to that point, been studying medicine to pursue a career as a military surgeon. Despite the sudden change in plans, his decision to change professions had the full support of his parents. He reported to the Marine Schule in Kiel, the Higher Education Institute of the Imperial German Navy, in April of 1894 to begin his training. Soon after he had entered the Naval Academy, Kaiser Wilhelm II, the German head of state, came to Kiel in order to admit his son, Prince Adalbert, to the institute. The Kaiser's arrival proved to be a defining moment for Reda, 
who after attending a ceremony where the new cadets swore an oath of loyalty to their leader, felt not only that the naval officers were elite vanguards of the new German state, but that he himself was playing a central role in the German national story. Following six weeks of onshore infantry drill, Radar began service on training ships, where he learned basic skills of seamanship, including the handling of sails and navigation. After his first year, Radar finished at the top of his class for the practical and theoretical tests. He took two more years of advanced training in leadership and naval tactics before graduating as a naval officer in 1897 with the highest honors. Following his graduation, Rader received his first duty appointment in October of that year as a signal officer on board the SMS Deutschland, an armored cruiser ship assigned to the Far East. Rader's voyage to the Far East took him to Singapore as well as Korea and Japan, but more important than his visit to new exotic locations was his observations on what seemed to him and many German officers and officials to be a concerted effort by British and American leaders to curtail the German Empire's efforts to become an international colonial power backed by a strong navy. Radon noted that the British held the upper hand in the Far East, particularly in comparison to the relatively weak position of Germany outside of continental Europe. He also observed American hostilities towards the growing German power, a new attitude coming from the United States after his return to Germany in 1899, Rader was promoted and transferred to Leutnant Zerse. In late 1901, he was appointed as watch officer on the battleship Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosse, which was the flagship of Prince Heinrich, the commander of the first battleship squadron. Such an illustrious posting was considered a step towards the highest ranks of the German naval command. Rader was operating throughout this time in a navy dominated by Grand Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz, Secretary of State for the Imperial Naval Office from 1897 until 1916. Tirpitz believed in the expansion of German naval strength so as to compete with the Royal Navy and ultimately to be a conveyor of German power on the international stage. The Kaiser put great faith in Tirpitz and helped him to pass numerous bills aimed at promoting the expansion of German shipbuilding in the late 19th and early 20th century. As Germany rapidly expanded its navy, other global powers, particularly Great Britain, the preeminent global naval power at the time, grew increasingly alarmed. German leaders and officers such as Rader were well aware of this and were unconcerned. It was a small price to pay for global influence. Rader was one of many German naval officers who would be greatly impacted by Tirpitz and his belief that the power of a nation's fleet was inseparable from its overall influence on the world stage and required the focus and energies of a modern state to maintain an advanced fleet. At the heart of Tirpitz's plan was to target the British Royal Navy as a part of Germany's naval expansion, and he undertook to close the gap in the number of ships between the British and German fleets. Tirpitz thought it vital to German ambitions that their fleet be able to pose a substantial enough threat to the Royal Navy that the British would not risk taking it on in battle. Thus, he did not need to build up the German fleet so that it could defeat the Royal Navy, but just enough so that by confronting it, the British would suffer such grievous harm that they could no longer maintain their position of global influence. This risk theory was conceived to give the Germans the space they needed to pursue their global ambitions without British interference, resembling a naval form of mutually assured destruction. Due to his obvious potential for high command and his intellectual talents, in 1903, Rader embarked upon a two-year course at the Marine Academy in Kiel. During this time, Rader married his first wife, Augusta Schultz, and she gave birth to their first child in 1904, a daughter. Rader also wrote widely in these years, 
producing essays on a range of issues related to naval affairs, including international law and strategy, whilst he also spent some time in Russia in 1904. Rader's intellect and interest in strategy helped him stand out amongst his fellow junior naval officers. And in 1906, he was called to work for the Secretary of State for the Naval Office, Alfred von Tirpitz, in the News and Public Relations section. Tirpitz wished to raise support amongst the political class and the general public for his ambitious naval expansion. Rader's position at the Naval News Bureau brought him into close working contact with Tirpitz, and he was able to observe the way in which the Admiral handled relations with the Reichstag, the German parliament, and observed how the Navy was positioned as an institution upholding national unity. He worked with Tirpitz to help lobby the Reichstag to pass another Navy law in 1906, further escalating the Anglo-German arms race. Following his three-year service in Berlin, Rader returned to the sea and was appointed as naval officer on board the Kaiser's personal yacht, the SMS Hohenzollern. This position put Erich in direct contact with the head of state, and indeed, Rader would always hold admiration for the emperor and remained in some form of contact with him until Wilhelm's death in 1940. By 1911, Rader was a lieutenant commander, and the following year, he was assigned to serve as the top staff officer to the Admiralty in the scouting forces. He was thus in a key position to observe the naval operations in the last years before the outbreak of war on the continent. By 1914, he could observe the concerns of the German high command over the likelihood of a British naval blockade, concerns that turned out to be deeply prescient. On the 28th of June, 1914, when Eric Rader was 38, Shots rang out on the streets of Sarajevo in an event that would live in infamy as the trigger for the greatest conflict the world had yet witnessed. The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the next in line to the Austro-Hungarian throne by a Serbian nationalist group, led to a declaration of war on Serbia by the Austro-Hungarian Empire, following which the system of alliances that had developed in Europe over the previous decades, that had held Europe in a state of immobilizing tension and hostility for decades, triggered a series of declarations of war from the major powers in Europe. Russia began to mobilize its armies to defend Serbia on July the 30th, which prompted Germany, who regarded Russia as its most dangerous rival, to begin its own mobilization and after an ultimatum sent to Russia demanding it demobilize was ignored, Germany declared war on August the 1st. France, whose government and people held deep resentment towards Germany following the humiliation of the Franco-Prussian War of 1870, was bound by alliance to support Russia. Germany believed that it had to defeat France in order to take on Russia, and thus on August the 3rd, it declared war on France. British involvement was not a foregone conclusion, as it was not bound by treaty to intervene in support of France or Russia, despite being allied to both. However, Russia and France put great pressure on Britain to intervene, and the British were themselves concerned that a potential German victory would grant the Germans domination of the continent. Germany's invasion of neutral Belgium in an effort to attack France tipped the scales for Britain, which had long guaranteed Belgian neutrality, and on August the 4th, it declared war on Germany. All the major powers of Europe were now at war. In August of 1914, the commander of the German naval scouting forces, whose role was to carry out reconnaissance for the battle fleet, was Admiral Franz von Hipper, and his first staff officer and chief advisor was Erich Rader. Rader would later reflect that the German high command did not consider an outright conflict with the British Navy very likely, because it was believed that the war on the continent would be concluded swiftly in Germany's favor. 
Tirpitz's naval plans were not designed to win a war in 1914. They were ultimately focused on deterrence and providing a platform for Germany to become a global power in the long-term future. For the war at hand, it was the land army upon whom the war effort was primarily focused and who were expected to attain Germany's aims. Raider's first major contribution to the war was his involvement in the bombardment of the British coastal town of Great Yarmouth in Norfolk. He helped to plan the operation with Hipper, though they considered the operation a failure, and Raider bemoaned the lack of action on behalf of the German high seas fleet, which German military leaders were reluctant to bring into action and risk battle with the main British fleet. Raider experienced his first battle on the 24th of January 1915, when a German squadron, composed of battle cruisers, in an attempt to attack British fishing vessels, were intercepted by the British Grand Fleet, and the Germans were forced to make a fighting retreat. The Battle of Doggerbank saw the Germans lose a battle cruiser, the Blucher. Yet Raider, who himself had displayed courage under fire, praised the performance of the scouting forces in their first major engagement. German naval strategy, as the war progressed, became ever more focused upon fighting a war of attrition with small, mobile forces, particularly U-boats, targeting enemy shipping. Thus, the bulk of the Navy remained close to home in German waters. Things changed with the appointment of Admiral von Scheer to overall command in January 1916. Scheer began to lay the groundwork for a potential major fleet engagement against the British, a strategy that elicited praise from Raider. In May of 1916, Raider played a prominent role in planning an attack on British targets in the North Sea that would lead to the greatest naval battle of the First World War, the Battle of Jutland. This battle was a cornerstone of German and British naval history, and its outcome and impact are still contested by historians. Raider's scouting squadron of battle cruisers under von Hipper's command were to advance towards the Norwegian coast, with the main high seas fleet under Scheer's command following around 50 miles behind them. The British, who had intercepted previous German communications, once more intercepted German communications detailing the Germans' plan, leading to the commander of the British Grand Fleet, John Jellicoe, to order his battleships to set out from their base in the Orkney Islands to intercept the German vessels. The advanced units of both forces began to clash at around 2.30 p.m. on the 31st of May. German ships gained the initial advantage in the battle as Hipper's battle cruisers inflicted severe damage on the British vanguard. However, Scheer's high seas fleet then stumbled into the firing line of Jellicoe's Grand Fleet and was only able to extricate itself and avoid excessive damage due to the disciplined seamanship of the German crews and the effectiveness of the battleships themselves. It took a great charge from the German torpedoes and battle cruisers straight at the main British line to allow Scheer to escape with his main fleet. The British overestimated the danger of this torpedo advance, and Jellicoe ordered the Grand Fleet to turn away. Raider ship sustained heavy damage, forcing him and Hipper to transfer to a torpedo boat where they watched the remainder of the fight, with Raider being a vital advisor to Hipper during the engagement. Raider spent hours after the battle working to collect information on the losses and damages sustained by both fleets. Eventually, it became clear that the German Navy could claim victory over the British, having inflicted worse losses on the enemy and in so doing achieving Germany's greatest naval victory in its young history. The British lost three battle cruisers, three cruisers, and eight destroyers, compared to the German losses of one battleship, one battle cruiser, four light cruisers, and five torpedo craft. Whilst British personnel losses had been heavy at over 6,700 men killed or wounded, in contrast to the loss of little over 3,000 for the German high seas fleet. This represented the bloodiest single day in the history of the British Navy, 
and the initial German reaction was jubilant. The German press advertising their triumph to the nation and to the world. However, as time went on, it became clear that the Battle of Jutland did not meaningfully alter the strategic situation in the North Sea. The Royal Navy, which was able to withstand such losses, remained dominant in the North Sea and posed a continual risk to the German High Seas fleet. Historians tend to view the Battle of Jutland as a strategic victory for the British in the long run, as the German fleet remained contained for the remainder of the war and the British blockade of Germany was never broken. The failure of Jutland to make a dent in British naval dominance led to a turn in strategy towards unrestricted submarine warfare on the 1st of February, 1917, as the Germans focused on using U-boats to attack Allied shipping lanes, and radar and the German fleet were forced to support this strategy. Rada supported the decision to engage in unrestricted submarine warfare, though he would later state that he regretted the failure of diplomacy, which led to the entry of the United States into the war against Germany. However, the mutual hostility generated between U-boat crews and the officers of the High Seas Fleet, and the conflict between those who favored a U-boat strategy and those who advocated the primacy of the battleship, grew in the final years of the war and would persist long after 1918. In the last year of the war, Rader was promoted once again and now given his own command on board a new light cruiser. He was now able to wield influence at the top of German military command, and in mid-November he was appointed as chief of staff at the Reichsmarineamt, which was the top administrative body of the German Navy following the signing of the armistice on the 11th of November, 1918, which saw Germany surrender to the Allies on all fronts. Prior to the armistice, Rader had begun to fear what surrender could mean for the German Navy, which remained active right up to the end of the war, both building new U-boats and planning maneuvers for the High Seas Fleet. However, as the commanders of the High Seas Fleet planned a final great battle to restore German naval pride before the war's end, mutiny began to spread amongst the crew members. Rader was sent to assess the situation at the port town of Wilhelmshaven, and to his shock, he saw that the revolt had spiraled out of control, and by the 9th of November, the Kaiser was informed that his navy could no longer be relied upon to fight. What was worse for the top naval officers such as Rader was that this naval mutiny sparked a wider communist movement that spread throughout Germany. Rader later argued that the communist parties had organized a plot against the navy, and he partially blamed the inactivity of the high seas fleet for sparking discontent in the ranks of the sailors. Rader and his fellow officers worked hard to regain control fighting back against the sailors' councils that had been established by the mutineers to organize their resistance. By early 1919, with the help of the government, the officer corps was able to reassert authority over the Navy, just as the Weimar Republic was establishing itself as Germany's new form of government, amidst the anarchic street fighting between communist and far-right paramilitary groups. The chaotic post-war months were a trying time for Germany's naval officers, many of whom lost faith in the Navy and the officer corps. Though Rader and many of his fellow officers felt no strong loyalty towards the Republic, they fixed their minds upon higher loyalties towards the country and the Navy. Rader was encouraged by the appointment in early 1919 of his favored candidate as Commander-in-Chief of the Navy. Adolf von Trotha. Under the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, Germany's naval force was dramatically cut back, with only 15,000 men permitted to serve, along with a total prohibition of submarines. Rader, however, did not for a moment think this situation would last, and believed that in the future he would help to guide the Navy and indeed the country back to its former glory. First, however, Rader and his fellow officers had to find a way for the Reichsmarine 
to survive the terms of the Versailles Treaty. The restrictions relegated Germany overnight from its status as a naval power to that of a minor nation and set draconian restrictions on future ship constructions. The one positive aspect of the Versailles Treaty for the German Navy was that it united Navy personnel of all ranks in opposition to the treaty. And Admiral von Trotha spoke for the entire institution when he urged the government not to sign it. In this spirit of defiance, ship commanders began scuttling German ships rather than handing them over to the Allies, providing a morale boost that went throughout the Navy. The treaty was eventually signed by the government in June 1919, but the naval spirit of defiance was now blazing out of control and would lead to the Cap Putsch of 1920. The Cap Putsch began as a rebellion by members of the Freikorps, a right-wing paramilitary force made up of First World War soldiers after the Weimar government attempted to disband them in March. The Freikorps, which included members of the naval forces, marched against the government in Berlin and overthrew them, declaring a new government headed by Wolfgang Kapp. Admiral Trotha and the top naval command, including Rader, immediately declared their loyalty to the new government in Berlin, despite the former government having fled further south. Though the naval officers presented themselves as wanting simply to maintain law and order, in reality, they were keen to see the imposition of a right-wing government to replace the Republic. The Putsch soon dissolved after the Weimar government called for a general strike which paralyzed Berlin and the country. Even within the Navy, many of the ordinary crews did not share the officers' support of the Cap Putsch and instead supported the general strike. This was a double-edged embarrassment for the Naval High Command because not only had they thrown their support behind a failed coup attempt, but they had been unable to prevent splits emerging between naval crew and officers for the second time since the end of the war. The government and public opinion of the Navy had never been lower. Trotter was removed from command. Raider himself was investigated for his role in the affair, and though exonerated, he was pressured to take an out-of-sight role in the naval archives to help write the official naval history of the Great War. The post-war years had been traumatic for Eric. He had divorced from his wife in 1919 and lost two of his brothers during the Great War. Though he remarried, more than ever, he clung to his duty and service to see him through. Rader held a position in the naval archives for two years, hoping to step back and allow the fallout from the Cap Putsch to cool before resuming his advancement through the ranks. Indeed, in July 1922, he attained the rank of Rear Admiral, being appointed as Inspector of Naval Education. Though he kept away from any political maneuvering, Rader hoped ultimately for a national regeneration led by a right-wing dictatorship. He believed that the nation could only be brought back to its pre-war greatness through these means. Accusations of Raider and the Navy's close ties to right-wing anti-Republican reactionary groups continued through the 1920s. In 1928, the Navy was shook by the Lohmann Affair, which revealed the use of secret funds to support illicit rearmament. This crisis led to the removal of many of the German Navy's top officers and opened the opportunity for Raider to reach the pinnacle of the Reichsmarine. Though he played down his interest in the role of Navy chief, Raider thought himself to be the most suitable candidate for the role, as did many of the top naval officers. Though there was considerable resistance to his appointment by much of the press and left-wing groups who saw him as a right-wing reactionary and a threat to the Republic, nevertheless, Defense Minister Gröner had faith in Raider, and in October of 1928, at the age of 52, Raider was promoted to the rank of Admiral and made Chief of the Naval Command of the Reichsmarine.
Rader immediately set about establishing his absolute authority over all aspects of naval administration and creating a unified system of loyalty to him and his principles. He understood that in order to achieve its aim of rearmament and regaining its lost power and prestige, the Navy had to regain popularity with the government and with the German people at large. Rader believed the chaos in the Navy's top ranks and the inability to show unity throughout the Navy in the post-war years had been at the root of its struggles. Rader's directives and guidelines for naval operations issued a year after he took command were, by his own admission, authoritarian in character. But he was determined to create loyalty and unity throughout the Navy by any means necessary. The central government, though not the Reichstag, was supportive of Rader's ambitions to restore Germany's naval strength, and in 1928 supported the establishment of a secret budget to fund rearmament, even though this technically violated German law under the terms of the Versailles Treaty. Though Rader sought to avoid any more political fallout, he was well aware of political radicalism within the Navy, which in 1929 was primarily the influence of the National Socialist Movement within the naval ranks amongst the officers and crew. Into the early 1930s, the support for the Nazi party grew amongst these men as the younger officers and crew were increasingly frustrated with the Republic's stance on rearmament and foreign policy. Reports from his admirals informed Rader of this support and they even warned of the Navy's loyalty in the event of a seizure of power by Hitler. Rader was still personally hostile to the Weimar Republic. However, since the elevation of Germany's most iconic First World War general, Paul von Hindenburg, to the presidency, his attachment to the government had grown, and he was keen to support Hindenburg wherever possible. As he became aware of the growth of the National Socialist Movement, Rader was keen to learn more about the Nazis and their potential impact upon the Navy. He was wary of Hitler, who in his book Mein Kampf had dismissed the importance of German naval power and overseas colonies whilst criticizing the naval leadership of World War I. Despite this, Rader still hoped for the success of the National Socialists, as he supported their nationalistic military empowerment stance and their fervent anti-communism. Rader still viewed communism as a far greater threat to the Navy. Hitler's appointment as Chancellor in 1933 was welcomed by most of the naval officer corps, including Rader, heralding what they believed to be the long-awaited leader who would rekindle German national pride and place the military and the Navy once again at the center of the national body politic. Rader now set about the task of convincing Hitler of the Navy's importance for the latter's plans of national regeneration. Hitler informed Rader of his intention to abandon the Versailles Treaty and begin naval and army reconstruction, as well as his domestic social goals to enhance national spirit and eliminate unemployment. This was music to Rader's ears, though in his memoirs, written after World War II, Rader did not mention Hitler speaking to him of Lebensraum and German conquest, despite other senior military officers reporting Hitler saying this at the time. As Rader worked with Hitler, he sought to help expand Hitler's vision of the potential of the Navy. Hitler had spent most of his life in Austria and southern Germany, far away from the Baltic and North Sea naval ports, and he had served in the trenches of the Western Front, he thus had relatively little knowledge of, or interest in, the Navy. Yet, as Hitler and his Nazi party began to monopolize power in Germany by banning rival parties and ruling by decree, it was vital for Rader to make clear the Navy's total loyalty to him. The Navy thus enthusiastically joined the Third Reich, with the top command encouraging obedience and respect towards the Nazis and merging naval history with the vision of the National Socialists. Much to the satisfaction of the Nazi propagandists, Rader and most of his officers 
shared the ultimate goals of the pre-war naval command for the German fleet to become a vehicle for the nation to express global influence. Once the Nazis had revived the nation internally, it was believed, the Navy would rise to prominence as a means of expanding power overseas. Raider soon took advantage of Nazi rule when in March 1934, he put forward his new shipbuilding program, dramatically overriding the Versailles Treaty by aiming for naval parity with France by the year 1949, constructing new battleships, aircraft carriers, and a large fleet of U-boats. Hitler was supportive of naval expansion, though long-term plans were not accepted immediately. Instead, the Führer involved himself in the gradual expansion of naval build-up ship by ship. Hitler was keen to prevent antagonism with Britain, and Raider did not see conflict with the Royal Navy as a possibility in the short or medium term. To this end, the Anglo-German Naval Agreement was signed in 1935, allowing the German Navy to be 35% the size of the Royal Navy. This allowed Rada and Hitler to violate the terms of the Versailles Treaty without drawing diplomatic antagonism from Britain. It is hard to know exactly what Rada thought about the most extreme ideological elements of Nazism. He does not seem to have been a virulent anti-Semite, although he never protested against anti-Jewish decrees, only registering complaints about how blatant shows of anti-Semitism such as the Night of Broken Glass riots in 1938, damaged Germany's reputation abroad. He formed strong opposition to many Nazi extremists when they began to infringe upon his authority within the Navy, particularly Reinhard Heydrich and Hermann Goering. Raider's anti-Semitism was not extreme by the standards of Nazi Germany, but he shared a level of anti-Semitism that was standard among most German conservatives. In February 1934, when an order was made to discharge any Jews serving in the Navy and armed forces, Raider carried these out without any hint of protest. And even before this, the Navy had long maintained an unwritten policy of refusing to accept Jewish officers. Raider was happy to go along with Nazi ideology up to a point, as long as it encompassed views that were broadly within the scope of his patriotic nationalist stance but its attacks against the traditional church he refused to abide and pushed back to ensure that church authority was not threatened within the Navy wherever he could. As the 1930s progressed, Hitler steadily increased his authority over the German military, becoming supreme commander of the armed forces in 1935. However, as the army's independence from the Nazi regime was eroded, the Navy retained a strong degree of autonomy. Raider's loyalty, as well as his general avoidance of politics, allowed him to remain atop the naval command, and he saw himself as steering a course whereby he avoided total ideological commitment to the regime whilst remaining loyal to it, so as to keep the ear of the Fuhrer to the benefit of the Navy. Raider's total obedience to the Nazi state was certain, but his internal convictions of ideological independence did not result in any kind of meaningful resistance to Hitler. In 1937, Raider presented his vision for the German Navy's global role to Hitler and the Nazi High Command, and how naval expansionism could aid the Fuhrer's own expansionist goals by ensuring Germany was well supplied and unable to be choked by a naval blockade as it was during the First World War. Raider put forward an aggressive maritime strategy that would seek to dominate shipping lanes in the Atlantic. Then in November of 1937, it was Hitler's turn to lay out his foreign policy plans to his top generals. Known as the Hossbach Memorandum, this meeting marks a sharp radicalization and the foreign policy goals that Hitler was willing to declare openly to his army. He spoke of his desire for annexation of Austria and Czechoslovakia as soon as was possible, and Germany's need for Lebensraum and his plans to attain this in Eastern Europe through military conquest. 
by 1938, naval war against Britain was becoming increasingly probable, where previously Hitler had sought to avoid it. As Hitler became more determined to move against Czechoslovakia, and Britain's opposition to this was made clear, Raider and his officers began to plan around a conflict with the Royal Navy. The England Memorandum of 1938 set out the challenges in combating the Royal Navy in any future conflict, and it set out what would become an integral part of German strategy, that is, the policy of focusing attacks upon commerce and waging an economic naval war. There soon developed an intensity within naval planning and construction, as it became clear that war was coming sooner than most had realized. Raider, now in his tenth year as commander of the Navy, felt intense pressure to accelerate building as 1939 dawned and war in Europe seemed inevitable. In March 1938, Germany and Austria had unified in the Anschluss, in violation of the Versailles Treaty. And on September 30th of that year, the Munich Agreement was reached, whereby France and Britain agreed to Hitler's annexation of the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia, in return for a promise of no further German territorial expansion. In January of 1939, therefore, Raider put forward the Z Plan. This outlined the construction of 10 battleships, 4 aircraft carriers, 5 heavy cruisers, and other vessels in order to take on the Royal Navy, whilst also ordering around 250 U-boats to be built. Raider targeted this to be done by 1948, but Hitler insisted on 1944. The importance of the Z-Plan was that Raider brought it forward alongside a demand that the Kriegsmarine, the Third Reich successor to the Reichsmarine, be given priority with regards to resource allocation ahead of the Army and Air Force in order that Hitler's targets for naval construction be met. Hitler's approval of the Z-Plan, along with his prioritization of the Navy amongst the German armed forces on the 27th of January 1939, seemed a vindication of Raider's relationship with Hitler and a triumphant moment for the Navy. The plan, however, was hopelessly ambitious and represented Raider being drawn towards building a grand fleet rather than preparing properly for a commercial war. The Z Plan also broke the terms of the Anglo-German Naval Agreement of 1935 and may have helped push Britain towards war. Changing circumstances soon saw the plan fade and the naval prioritization of resources dissipate. In the autumn of 1939, the German fleet was not complete nor ready for a global war. Hitler and the German high command remained ultimately focused upon the continent rather than future battles on the high seas. And whilst war with Britain was not in Raider's interests for some years, Hitler's pursuit of his goals on land forced the Navy to be dragged along with him into a war that they were not yet ready to fight. In April of 1939, Hitler made Raider a Grand Admiral a rank not held by any other naval commander. Weeks later, Hitler formally abrogated the Anglo-German naval agreement. Yet Raider had faith that Hitler would manage international diplomacy so as not to provoke world war in the immediate future. Raider's supreme faith in the Führer showed its first cracks when Hitler invaded Poland on the 1st of September, 1939. Following the invasion two days later, Britain and France declared war on Germany. Raider recorded his reaction, stating that, today the war against England and France broke out, which the Führer had previously assured us we would not have to confront until 1944, and which he believed he could avoid up to the last minute. Raider stated that his naval forces were in no way ready for the conflict with the Royal Navy and that in spite of a well-organized fleet of U-boats, they were still too weak to exert a decisive influence on the war. Nevertheless, Raider resolved not to allow the Navy to be the mostly passive observer that it had been in the First World War. 
The start of the war shifted Hitler's priorities towards the land war on the continent and towards the Soviet Union, with the Navy never again receiving priority in terms of resource allocation. Radar wanted more attention focused towards the global war at sea against Britain, whose Royal Navy had proved a decisive factor in the last World War, along with Karl Dönitz, commander of the Navy's U-boat squadrons and mastermind of Germany's attacks on Allied shipping in the Atlantic, Radar pressed Hitler to expand U-boat production, though production never reached the levels that were required. Radar was encouraged by the early success of German ships in attacking British vessels, with many Royal Navy ships sunk in the opening weeks by Germany's sudden attacks on the shipping routes. Radar sought to build on this with a campaign to lay mines along the east coast of Britain, which succeeded in causing damage to a number of British ships. As the German army geared up to strike west after the successful invasion of Poland in late 1939, Radar saw an opportunity for the Navy to make a major contribution to the war effort. The reputation of the Navy had been dinted in the eyes of the Führer during the Battle of the River Plate off the coast of South America. The Graf Spee, a damaged German ship facing a British force, was scuttled by its captain, thus saving the lives of his men, rather than fighting to the death. Hitler firmly believed that German forces everywhere had to fight to the last man and was furious upon hearing of the scuttling. Rader emphasized to his men that they must fight to the death rather than surrender, and he now looked to redeem the Navy in the eyes of Hitler. Radar had long been considering moves against Scandinavia to take advantage of its geography. In particular, the Norwegian North Sea coast had numerous locations for German naval bases, from where a more effective U-boat campaign against British shipping could be launched. In addition, the occupation of Norway would prevent Allied forces linking up with the Soviets through Finland whilst also protecting vital iron ore shipments from Sweden, and Radar believed the British to be planning for a Norwegian occupation of their own. In October 1939, with the approval of Hitler, planning for a Norwegian campaign was underway. The Allies saw Norway as vital to the German war effort, as German steel production was reliant upon iron ore from Sweden that was exported to Germany through Norway and particularly through the crucial port of Narvik. As the Allies realized that German plans for an invasion were underway, they decided to challenge the Germans by making invasion preparations of their own. On April the 9th, German troops moved into Norway in a lightning attack, whilst Norwegian waters swarmed with German ships. German troops rapidly seized Oslo and a number of key ports along the coast. At the same time, Germany sent ships into Copenhagen Harbor to land their troops and seize control of Denmark. As German troops moved up through Norway, combined attacks by land and sea targeted its northern ports, with German destroyers landing troops to seize the important port of Narvik. The Allies focused their counterattack on Narvik and managed to retake the port from the Germans on the 28th of May. However, with the collapse of the French armed forces by mid-June, the Allies found little reason to continue holding the Norwegian port and had evacuated Norway, leaving it in German hands. Though the German Navy played a vital role in the successful invasion, it paid dearly for its involvement. As the Allied submarines mobilized, they caused severe damage on German transport ships, whilst dive bombers sank the cruiser Königsberg in Bergen Harbor. In Narvik, the Royal Navy launched a surprise attack, sinking two German destroyers and damaging three, though the Germans were able to counterattack and sink two of the attacking British destroyers, including the flagship HMS Hardy. In the final Allied invasion, the German Navy also managed to sink the HMS Glorious, which was carrying the last contingent of RAF pilots and planes on its decks. Nevertheless, 
The Kriegsmarine had lost a heavy cruiser, two light cruisers, and ten destroyers, losses that it was not in a position to sustain in the midst of a war in which it was already overstretched. Two of the Navy's best ships, the Scharnhorst and the Neisenau, which had sunk the HMS Glorious, were so damaged in their attack that they were put out of operation for months. Operation Visarubung was nevertheless a success in the short term, and Rader believed the Navy to have proved its worth by spearheading this campaign. However, some would argue that Rader had committed far too many of his best ships to the Norway campaign out of his desperation to ensure that the Kriegsmarine was seen as being an active contributor to the German war effort. This meant that the German Navy was heavily reliant on U-boat attacks instead of large-scale fleet operations for the remainder of the war. Raider was determined to utilize Norway for the German war effort to the fullest extent, insisting on making Trondheim the primary base for the German fleet. Even after the fall of France in late June of 1940 and the opening of the French Atlantic ports to the Germans, his insistence on the importance of Norway most likely reflected his refusal to countenance the sacrifices made by the Navy in April and May 1940 going to waste in any way. After the fall of France, Raider and the Navy began to make long-term plans for the future of the Navy and its role in bringing Germany fully onto the global stage as a world power. Part of these plans involved the division of the colonial possessions of Britain and France between Germany and Italy, and ensuring Germany had prime access to the seas to allow it to take its place as the foremost colonial world power. They also envisioned a massive expansion of Germany's naval rearmament, planning ultimately for 80 battleships, over 200 cruisers, and 500 U-boats. All of these plans assumed that Britain would surrender imminently, given Germany's dominant position in the summer of 1940. Their plans were further wrecked by the Führer, who had turned his attention towards Russia. However, in August 1940, Hitler still was focused on Operation Sea Lion, the invasion of Britain. Hitler considered numerous political and military options for dealing with Britain, as his ultimate goal was to neutralize any Western threat in order to strike east. But Raider was strongly opposed to an invasion. He knew that the Kriegsmarine, even before its battering in the Norwegian campaign, did not have the strength to support such an operation. Raider convinced Hitler that an invasion could only take place under particular conditions, namely once German air superiority was established over the English Channel. Raider was nevertheless ordered to begin planning for an invasion, and immediately he clashed with Hitler and the army generals over details such as the landing location and the date of any attack. Raider proposed a later date in May of 1941, whilst Hitler was pressing for an invasion to occur in the autumn of 1940. In early September, the Germans began gathering resources at the Channel ports in preparation for a large seaborne assault. However, it soon became clear that the Luftwaffe was not winning the aerial battle, and its decision to bomb civilian targets was not having the desired effect upon British morale. In October, Raider pressed for Sea Lion's suspension, as neither German air nor naval superiority in the English Channel appeared likely in the foreseeable future. Hitler agreed, yet he ordered the Navy to remain prepared for an invasion. Early 1941 saw the Kriegsmarine begin to see greater success due to Germany's new Atlantic bases on the French coast. Operation Berlin, from January to March 1941, saw German battleships set loose upon the Atlantic, with the battleships sinking over 20 merchant vessels in only two months. Whilst causing enormous concern among Allied planners, this momentum could not be maintained for long, however, as the Navy's lack of ships, an RAF bombing campaign against the French ports, 
and Hitler's fear of provoking the US by expanding German operations in the Atlantic saw the initial German success begin to dissipate. With Operation Sea Lion scrapped, Raider began to put forward his Mediterranean strategy as an alternative. Raider believed this strategy would allow Germany to strike at Britain on the periphery and dominate a sea that was vital to Britain's shipping lanes, whilst giving Germany a foothold towards advancing her global ambitions by claiming bases in North Africa and the Mediterranean. Raider's plans included seizing the Suez Canal, occupying North Africa, and taking the Canary Islands and Azores as Mediterranean bases. Though promising, his Mediterranean plan was thwarted by Hitler's relative lack of interest and the Italian presence in the region, which the dictator of Italy, Benito Mussolini, insisted on being his sphere of influence. German troops thus only came to North Africa upon Italy's request for aid in 1941. This was the Africa Corps under General Erwin Rommel, and by that time the goals were more limited as Hitler's attention was firmly set towards the east. Rader would later state that he had long argued against an invasion of Russia, though whether he was opposed due to the potential damage it could bring to the war effort, or because such an operation prevented the Navy from having a significant impact on the war, is hard to say. Hitler promised Rader that once Germany's last great enemy on the continent had been dealt with, then focus would turn again to the global war against Britain's navy. On the 22nd of June, 1941, the invasion of the Soviet Union began at last, and with it, Raider and the Navy's dreams of world dominance were torpedoed. Despite Operation Barbarossa's immense scale and ideological importance to the Nazi party, Raider continued to insist that the Atlantic was the most important theater of war and demanded that more attention be given to naval operations. Hitler, however, was wary of provoking the United States by fully committing to the Atlantic U-boat war. Raider was opposed to communism, but saw the Soviet Union as an ally against Britain, France, and the United States, who he viewed as preventing Germany from becoming a world power. Raider and Hitler both envisioned Germany as a world power, but the way they wanted to pursue this diverged drastically, something that only became more evident with each passing day. Hitler was also frustrated at the sinking of the great battleship Bismarck in May of 1941. The Bismarck was one of the largest and most impressive battleships in the world, at over 800 feet long and after being sighted off the Norwegian coast, it was engaged by a powerful Royal Navy squadron, including the battleship Prince of Wales and the battlecruiser HMS Hood. After damaging the Prince of Wales and destroying the Hood, the Bismarck escaped into open sea, leading to a great search operation by the Royal Navy. The Bismarck was found near the coast of occupied France and bombarded by torpedo bombers which rendered the ship immobile before being attacked by a British fleet. Eventually, the order went out to scuttle the ship to prevent it falling into enemy hands, and only 115 of a crew of over 2,200 men survived. The sinking of the Bismarck, a great blow to German prestige, fatally undermined Hitler's trust in Raider for the remainder of the war and Raider was ordered to prevent any more damage to Germany's major capital ships. Throughout 1941 and even earlier, Raider had been hoping for the entrance of Japan into the war against the United States. He realized that the opening of conflict in the Pacific theater would divert Allied forces and distract America from the Atlantic, allowing the Kriegsmarine to isolate Britain. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941 made this hope a reality, opening a new ocean front in the war. However, whilst this was theoretically advantageous for Germany, 
its navy lacked the capacity to coordinate a global maritime war with Japan against the Allies, creating new frustrations for Raider and his admirals. That America would now be entering the war did not bother Raider, who, unlike Hitler, took a bellicose attitude towards the US and saw them as a natural enemy of German ambitions. He had long been pressing for permission to shoot US vessels escorting British shipping on site, believing that the Kriegsmarine could cripple the US naval presence in the Atlantic. Germany duly declared war on America on the 11th of December 1941, thus unleashing Raiders' fleet of U-boats. The late spring and summer of 1942 saw German U-boats cause devastation against the American Navy, the height of their effectiveness against the U.S. in the war. The U-boat successes heightened the prestige of the Navy in the German High Command, although much of the plaudits went to Admiral Dönitz, commander of the U-boat fleet, who was a critic of Raider for his devotion to old-fashioned battleship warfare. Relations between Dönitz and Raider suffered as the war went on, with the former, resentful of Raider for not prioritizing U-boat construction before the war, and Raider incensed by Dönitz's contempt for the naval officer establishment. Despite the contempt the men had for each other, new events in the Mediterranean gave Raider hope at last of a great strategic victory for the Kriegsmarine, though it was to be his final attempt to seize the initiative of the German war effort. Raider's plan, put forward in February 1942, sought to coordinate Germany's efforts with Italy and Japan and aimed to strike at the Suez Canal in the eastern Mediterranean to both disrupt British shipping and open a link between the German Navy in the Atlantic and the Japanese in the Pacific. Raider was encouraged in his goals by the success of Erwin Rommel's Africa Corps as they drove back the Allies along the North African coast towards Egypt in the early months of 1942. Alongside the capture of the Suez Canal, Raider's plan called for the seizure of the island of Malta, just south of Sicily in the Mediterranean, as a base for the German Navy and Air Force. Raider's plan, however, never took shape. The German and Japanese forces did not establish the level of cooperation in the Near East that was required, as the Japanese were focused on Southeast Asia, whilst the focus of the Nazi top brass was by this point firmly on the Russian invasion, which was facing serious problems. Raider could not bring the cooperation of land, air and sea forces to bear, nor were the Germans able to destroy the Allied defenses on Malta despite a concerted bombing campaign. Raider's grand triumph was once again denied. In November of 1942, Allied forces made surprise landings in North Africa in Operation Torch, setting the Axis powers onto the defensive in the Mediterranean theater and signaling the end of Raider's ambitions in the Near East. Though German U-boats continued to be successful in the Atlantic, traditional warships were bottled up in ports surrounding continental Europe. This further diminished Raider's prestige as his advocacy for surface ships and their role in the Atlantic came to be seen as a failed strategy. Since the Bismarck sinking, surface ships had hardly played a role in the Atlantic theater. Raider became increasingly disillusioned with the war effort and with the Führer. The fatal incident occurred in late December 1942, when a German surface squadron in the North Sea spotted Allied shipping heading towards the northern Russian port of Murmansk. With the Eastern Front in a serious situation for the Germans, Hitler was desperate for the convoy to be sunk, as Allied shipping was vital to supplying the Soviet war effort. The German squadron reported their approach to the Allied vessels and then reported that they had engaged. Confused communications meant that Hitler was convinced that the Allied ships had been sunk. However, when he found out later that the German ships had actually taken damage before evacuating, he was incandescent with fury. His explosions of anger at Raider and the Navy 
reflected his despair at Germany's failing war effort overall. But instead of aiding the cause, it instead damaged Hitler's relationship with the Grand Admiral beyond repair, as Hitler had attacked not just Raider, but the honor and spirit of the Navy itself. Raider was not suited to the world of cutthroat political intrigue that now surrounded Hitler. And as he refused to spend his time lingering in the Führer's inner circle, he became more isolated from the center of decision-making. Raider clashed with many of those closest to Hitler, such as Hermann Goering and Joseph Goebbels. Admiral Karl Dönitz, an ideologically committed Nazi, was far more popular than Raider with Hitler's inner circle. And as an increasing rift developed between Raider and Dönitz over U-boat policy, the latter came to be seen more and more as the leading figure in the Navy, and Dönitz himself became more contemptuous of Raider's authority. Dönitz was known to ridicule Raider's obsession with battleships, which he labeled as dinosaurs. In January 1943, just weeks after Hitler's furious criticism of him following the failure to intercept the Murmansk shipping convoy, Raider met with Hitler and asked to be relieved of his duties at the end of the month, an offer Hitler readily accepted. In his last memorandum, Raider bemoaned the sudden outbreak of war which had prevented the Navy from building the fleet that he had envisioned. He also praised the spirit of the Navy in taking the war to the Allies despite being greatly outnumbered. Raider's pleas to recognize the importance of the fleet was to no avail. Shortly after he departed, Hitler and Dönitz decommissioned the Navy's large surface ships to focus upon U-boats, tanks for the Eastern Front, and Western coastal defenses. Germany was now well and truly on the defensive and Raider's ambitions, held by the old naval establishment since German unification, for a grand surface fleet to dominate the globe, were finished. Raider made no attempt to denounce Hitler or the Nazi regime. Far from it, upon his stepping down from command, he urged the Navy to retain the utmost loyalty to Hitler and to the National Socialist State. In his retirement, Raider stayed out of the war for its remainder, though he visited Hitler shortly after the assassination attempt against him on the 20th of July, 1944, to assure him of his personal loyalty. As Soviet troops approached Berlin, Raider would not countenance fleeing the city and remained to see the unconditional German surrender on the 7th of May, 1945. Raider was placed under house arrest by the Soviet military and was then sent to Moscow as a prisoner of war, though he was well treated. When he learned that he was to be tried as a war criminal by the Western powers, Raider was shocked and contemplated serving for the Soviet Union as an alternative. Raider nevertheless appeared at the Nuremberg Trials, where an international military tribunal was held to prosecute Nazi leaders for their crimes against humanity and international peace. Officers from the U.S. and Royal Navy urged against prosecuting Raider and Dönitz, but these objections were overridden by the prosecution. Raider's trial lasted for six days, from the 15th to the 21st of May, 1946. The tribunal did not allow the presentation of any evidence regarding the actions of the Allied powers, which Raider found particularly galling. During the trial, he had to defend his actions in building up the Navy in violation of the Treaty of Versailles, which he insisted was built up for defensive rather than offensive purposes, and his support of Hitler. Raider defended himself at all times, seeking to protect the independence of the Navy. And he insisted that the Navy was not ready for war in 1939, and thus he had not sought conflict. Raider stated, that he had no knowledge of the Holocaust, and that if he had, he would have moved to intervene. Above all, he insisted that he had fought the war fairly, as a soldier rather than a criminal. In the end, Raider was found guilty on counts of conspiracy to commit crimes against peace, waging a war of aggression, and war crimes. 
he was sentenced to life imprisonment. Rader requested to be executed by firing squad instead, but this was denied. There has been debate amongst historians as to whether this judgment against Rader was excessively harsh. Rader's waging of war is not judged by most to constitute war crimes, as the German Navy fought no differently than the Allies at sea. However, Rader's tenacious support of the Nazi regime once they were in power cannot be denied. And even if he was not involved in the most hideous aspects of the regime, support from top military men like him enabled the Nazis to take hold of the German state apparatus and inflict horrors against humanity. Rader, now 70 years of age, was imprisoned at Spandau on the outskirts of Berlin. Previously used to intern opponents of the Nazi regime, it now housed Rader along with six other high-profile Nazi leaders who were found guilty in the Nuremberg trials. These included Karl Dönitz, Albert Speer, and Rudolf Hess. Rader was released after 10 years in prison at a similar time to Karl Dönitz, and upon their release, they made a public display of solidarity. His release had long been campaigned for by his family and by his naval colleagues. He spent the final years of his life working on his memoirs, which he published in two volumes in 1956 and 1957, under the title Mein Leben, My Life. The focus of this work was on portraying a sympathetic and positive picture of the Navy and Raider's role within it. He also involved himself in supporting the Bundesmarine, the new West German Navy, encouraging officers of the Kriegsmarine to join the new force. Though he attempted to stay out of public attention, he was a controversial figure in national politics when his legacy was invoked by the new naval leadership and his attendance at some naval events also stirred controversy over the past. Eventually, Rader succumbed to old age and passed away on the 6th of November, 1960, in Kiel, just over a year after the death of his wife. As a mark of their reconciliation, Rader asked Karl Dönitz to deliver the eulogy at his funeral. At his funeral, Rader was lamented as the father of the modern German Navy, and as a man who had kept the Navy unified and strong, whilst demonstrating humanity and morality to his subordinates at all times. Meanwhile, Rader's passing sparked a debate in German politics and the media as to whether the man convicted at the Nuremberg trials could be remembered as anything other than a criminal. These varied reactions to his passing were perhaps apt for a man whose legacy will always be clouded in controversy. Eric Rader was an intelligent, disciplined and driven man whose formidable leadership qualities enabled him to rise to the top of the German Navy and dominate it for well over a decade, steering it through some of the most turbulent and chaotic periods of Germany's history. He was a man committed to fundamental principles, and he put his service towards what he saw as the interests of the Navy and the country before all else. He never abandoned his commitment towards the Navy and towards his country, serving them as best he could, even when it would have been easier for him to abandon them. Nevertheless, whilst one cannot fault Rader for the level of his commitment to his core principles, one can very easily argue that his commitment blinded him to what the true interests of his country and the Navy were, and that they rendered him blind in the face of an evil that was increasingly recognized by others. In his belief that Hitler would revitalize the Navy and the country, Rader pledged total loyalty to him, and these soldierly instincts persisted even as the Nazi regime drove the Navy and the country to destruction. Other army officers like Stauffenberg and Rommel eventually turned against Hitler, whilst Rader stayed totally loyal to the very end. And though he was a Navy man before he was a Nazi, he still wore the golden Nazi party badge on his uniform with pride until the end of the war. Those with total ideological commitment to the Nazi project were a fringe minority, but it was respected and capable men like Rader 
from within the establishment, whose embrace of the Nazis helped them to establish their grip on the German state and armed forces. For this, history will always judge him harshly. What do you think of Eric Rader? Was he a war criminal who was as guilty as his fellow Nazis? Or was he simply a loyal sailor who avoided controversy and supported his nation's government no matter what? Please let us know in the comments section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.